elliptic orbits through the complex plane. Back when Copernicus was moving the sun to the center of the universe, complex numbers were just being born and had a lot of growing up to do. In a Cartesian or polar form, complex numbers provide hidden insight into geometric and algebraic problems. The imaginary unit i equal to the square root of negative 1 creates a two-dimensional landscape for a number to occupy, and thus a vector space is used to represent the geometry of the complex transformations. The complex plane in some sense hides in a hidden dimension perpendicular to our direct measurements. And for that reason, it can seem very mysterious. Because geometry connects dimensions, we can extract some useful information from this hidden dimension. By marrying Descartes' coordinate plane with the rules governing the number i, complex analysis provides a somewhat magical insight into how behaviors are measured in the real world and how they correlate to that which can be measured in the complex set of rules. Descartes was no stranger to complex numbers. Understanding these values as numbers was still in its infancy. However, he was still able to make a few connections given the success of people like Girolamo Cardano, who used complex numbers to solve cubic equations. It was in fact Descartes in 1637 who coined the unfortunate term imaginary, and it stuck. And during his publication, he would use geometric series to argue for the factorization theorem of polynomials. This would then lay the groundwork for Gauss to later develop this theorem. What Descartes realized was that every linear factor would reduce the polynomial down by one degree and that that process could be continued until the entire polynomial was factored. Euler's formula for a complex number allows us to write the factor z minus c sub k as a complex number in polar form. And when we do that for each factor, the polynomial takes on a more vivid form. We can see that Euler's formula will map a complex number to a circle of a specific radius, centered at the origin. The field of complex analysis is the study of complex valued functions and the secrets that they possess. A complex function maps a complex planar object to another complex planar object, and as such can be described geometrically as transformations of the complex plane onto itself, a z-plane onto a w-plane. Another type of complex function is called a modular surface and is a powerful tool in complex analysis. Now a modular surface takes f of z, a function of a complex variable, as an input. The image of f of z, of a point z in the complex plane, may be viewed or described as a distance or modulus from the origin above a point z on the complex plane, and it is the set of all values of this modulus that constitutes the modular surface. One example is f of z is equal to z. Since z grows linearly, we produce a conical modular surface stemming from the origin of the complex plane. Another example would be f of z is equal to z squared. The modulus of this function is a modular surface that produces a paraboloid, a bowl-shaped surface. So modular surfaces can provide some insight into the behavior of complex functions, especially as z grows large.
The geocentric enthusiast Giovanni Cassini studied Cassinian curves or Cassinian ovals in his exploration to describe the orbits of planets. Recall that an ellipse is the curve that results when requiring that the distances d1 and d2 from a focal point f1 and f2 to a point on the ellipse is always going to be constant. d1 plus d2 is always constant. But Cassini proposed instead that the curves describing orbits in a geocentric model followed the law that the product of those distances was what showed as constant. d1 times d2 is equal to k squared is often how this is expressed. Now although these curves didn't accurately describe the orbits of the planets, they still had value. Now taking these curves into the complex plane, let's see how these curves differ from the ellipse. And we're going to let a1 and a2 be numbers in the complex plane, as well as being the foci for our ellipse. And so the distances from any point z to either of these foci, then summed together is always constant, let's call that constant l, shows us that for different values of l, we generate a family of confocal ellipses. And in 1687, Isaac Newton published his Principia, demonstrating that Kepler was in fact correct that planets do have elliptical orbits when he described his theory of gravitation. So again, although Cassinian curves were useless in actually describing planetary orbits, they do have value. In the complex planet Cassinian curve are curious creatures. They actually arise naturally in the study of polynomial curves in the complex plane. So consider the general quadratic q of z equals z squared plus p of z plus q. And let's say it has two roots a1 and a2 which are the foci and so that our polynomial here can be written in factored form as z minus a1 times z minus a2. Now, the fact that we have the factored form of this polynomial in the complex plane means that we can generate a modular form for it. And when we look at this polynomial in polar form, each of those complex numbers, given a modulus r1 and r2, and an angle, theta1 and theta2, we can put that together and generate the modular form. If we call r1 and r2 the product of such, the distances, k squared, we get the modular form, the distance above the complex plane to be given by k squared. And this surface is a cone-like surface. When it's near the point A1, and then as it moves forward or away from the complex plane, it behaves more like the paraboloid. And so you can see cross-sectional cuts of this modular surface create what we know to be our Cassinian family of curves. So a Cassinian curve is a curve in which the intersection of the surface with a plane parallel to the complex plane at a height k squared above it will produce a particular Cassinian curve. It is a basic geographic contour map of the modular surface produced by the quadratic. A straightforward extension of these ideas shows that the curves are pre-images of an origin-centered circle whose modular is constant, and under the mappings given by the nth degree polynomial, whose roots are the foci a1, a2 through, let's say, a n for an nth degree polynomial. Equivalently, Cassinian curves are the cross-sections of modular surfaces p, n, z, which is a surface containing n cone-like legs resting on the complex plane, and for large values of z, it resembles an axial symmetric modular surface, z to the nth power. For quadratics of degree two, we get a cross-sectional slice of a torus. In the complex plane, an elliptic function is a meromorphic function that satisfies two periodicity conditions. That makes it a doubly periodic function in the complex plane, helping us define hyperelliptic functions and modular forms. 
If omega 1 and omega 2 are complex numbers, such that f of z plus omega 1 is equal to f of z, as well as f of z plus omega 2 is equal to f of z, for all z in the complex plane, f is doubly periodic, and omega 1 and omega 2 are called the two periods of the function. Now, doubly periodic functions in the complex plane create what is known as a fundamental domain parallelogram in the complex plane. Let's take a look at what that looks like. A doubly periodic function induces a lattice structure over the complex numbers, a period lattice structure, which is like a crystal. Each cell parallelogram is called its fundamental domain, and it looks something like this. This fundamental domain repeats itself as the parallelogram will tile the entire complex plane. Now this lattice structure can also be viewed through the ideas in group theory. But if f is an elliptic function and gamma is a linear combination of these periods, then f of z plus gamma is equal to f of z holds true. Let the abelian group lambda be the abelian group generated by these periods over the integers, the set of all linear combinations where m and n are integers. This period lattice will geometrically tile the plane and everything that will happen in one fundamental domain will repeat in all fundamental domains. The elliptic functions therefore can be viewed as functions with the quotient group, complex numbers modded out by this group, and the quotient group is known as an elliptic curve, which can be identified as a parallelogram where opposite sides are identified and is topologically equivalent to a torus. So now we've come full oval, and I've gone elliptic. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please hit that like, subscribe, and notification bell for more videos, and I all wish you a happy new year.